Thanks everybody for joining us again. We're gonna start with our fourth and final session today. Um, we have three more speakers in the session. Um, first, we'll have Professor Yusuf Hashash along with um, Oka and Ilhan, and they're both from University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and their topic is deep learning-based site amplification models for Central and Eastern North America. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and let them get started. Okay. Um, thank you, Kristen. Can you hear me first? You're able to hear me? And you're able to see my screen? Yes, yes, sir. Yeah. Okay, great, great. Okay, well, uh, thank you so much uh, for inviting me. And uh, I am uh, sorry I was not able to be there in person. I just arrived today in Copenhagen, Denmark, to attend uh, the World Tunneling Conference. Uh, so today I will share with you the work that I have performed with uh, Dr. O'Connor uh, on the development of deep learning-based site amplification models uh, with a focus on Central and Eastern North America. Um, there are many, many people we would like to acknowledge in the, if, who contributed to this work. First, the NGA East Geotechnical Working Group, Professor Stewart, Professor Rashi, Dr. Campbell, Dr. Silva, uh, in collaboration with Dr. Nicolau, uh, Dr. Joseph Harmon, and Dr. Gary Par uh, <laughs> Dr. Parker. Um, uh, and um, also, uh, we have the overall NGA East project, NSF, USGS, NRC, and the Ministry of uh, National Education in Turkey. Um, start with some uh, very basic background definitions so that we're all on the same page, what we mean by site amplification models. I uh, will talking about both conventional site amplification functions and then deep learning ANN-based site models. And... Um, then we'll talk a bit more about how what there's a bit of an echo I'm hearing. Okay, um, and and then there is the I will talk about the motivation motivation why we wanted to um, is to perform simulation based site amplification models for the Central and Eastern North America and we'll describe the, this series of simulations, the parametric study and the use of high-performance high computing resources. Then I'll go into the assessment of site amplification models, both the conventional models, the ANN models, give you the pros and cons of each and have some concluding remarks. And I look forward also to the Q&A session afterwards. Uh, so, how are we defining site amplification? We're defining it the same way it's uh, widely used in the community. Um, natural logarithm of amplification is the natural logarithm of a ground motion intensity measure at the ground surface divided by the ground motion intensity measure at the reference rock. The ground and in the intensity measure could be PGA, PGV, spectral acceleration, Fourier amplitude spectrum, and so on and so forth. Uh, classically, the um, uh, the total site amplification is described as the sum of linear and nonlinear components when we're using conventional models. Uh, this may or may not be used if you're using artificial neural networks. Uh, the linear amplification is uh, usually applies to low intensity uh, linear site response. It's dependent on site properties. And nonlinear uh, site amplification uh, is dependent on uh, is intensities and it's dependent on site properties and ground motion intensity. So, uh, when we are de developing conventional models, we are trying to we define a functional form, and sometimes based on the data, we might adjust the functional form. But you're really limited with the with the, such a defined functional form to describe site amplification. It is commonly used and it is modular in form, as I have described, whereby we have linear and nonlinear components. In the models that I would describe, the linear components uh, use both VS30 
as well as the natural period of the site uh, for defining the linear component. And then for the nonlinear component, we have uh, other measures to define, uh, the, to, to drive those models. For an artificial neural network, and in a little bit, a little bit later, I'll describe more uh, the artificial neural network. The definition of site amplification is exactly the same in terms of the ratio of the surface to a reference uh, condition intensity measure. The input is also exactly the same. You can have it modular or you can have it all use just a totality of it, whereby uh, something like things such as PGA. And the models learn directly from the data. Uh, there are hidden layers there that you, based on the training, you change the weights of them. And depending on the number of hidden layers, uh, as well as the number of these hidden nodes, uh, you can capture nuances of the site amplification that you don't usually have uh, otherwise. Uh, you can use the same structure for regardless of the type of amplification you are trying to capture. And that is nice and versatile because then you don't have to develop functional forms a priori that you can that won't change um, along the way as you are training these models. And as I mentioned, the same input is used. For output, you can have response spectrum, uh, you can have free amplitude spectrum, uh, and uh, so the same output, the input and output. So therefore, from a user experience, it's the same. It's just the internals of the calculations that would be different. Um, what motivated us to look into that and approach this problem? Uh, we're working as part of the NGA ESG Technical Working Group. Uh, we were trying to characterize site amplification in the Central and Eastern North America. And there, there are a few strong motion recordings uh, available for site characterization. Uh, and uh, GM development. And so therefore we uh, chose to synthetically develop these uh, uh, amplifications by conducting large scale simulations. Uh, we conducted uh, this, what I'm going to talk about is the second phase of uh, these simulations. We conducted large scale 1D site response simulations to capture uncertainty and variability of motions and site conditions. Uh, we also, and then we generated many of these. And uh, the case we're talking about today is it encompasses 3.6 million simulations, which were linear, equivalent linear, and nonlinear. And we use these to develop both conventional amplification models and an ANN type amplification models. And today I'm going to focus on the comparisons and the pros and cons. Uh, this is the parametric study tree that we conducted for the 1D site response analyses. Uh, we started, it's a, it's a large, very large scale uh, sim set of simulations. And the preceding one was uh, one by Harman et al., which was based, which resulted in 1.7 million analyses. Uh, we found there were some limitations in terms of the space it captures, and that's why the work by Ilhan et al. Uh, encompassed a much larger uh, space uh, for these simulations. We started with uh, 247 synthetic ground motions that are characteristics of the Central and Eastern North America. Then we uh, developed uh, representative VS profiles, uh, which we use for seed profiles. We collected data from 800 VS profiles and then uh, had 10 geology-based representative seed profiles, which we then randomized. Uh, we developed characteristics for the dynamic soil properties, modulus reduction, and damping curves. Uh, these were ba geology based nonlinear soil and rock properties. Uh, we randomized the VS uh, profiles as well as the dynamic uh, curves so that we can capture uncertainty or represent uncertainty and variability. Uh, this is the simulations we had in the latest simulations, which I'm going to talk about. Uh, we I illustrate here the type of variables that we inc we included uh, in our simulations, including, say, stress reversals. 
Um, then we looked at the depth bins, and here we used a broader uh, family of depth bins than we have done before. And then we uh, had models to represent the weather rock as we transition from the soil profile into the uh, hard rock or the reference rock with a VS of 3,000 meters per second. Uh, our analyses encompass equivalent linear, nonlinear, uh, and um, linear analyses. Uh, we use these for various purposes uh, in terms of developing linear amplification component for the for the modular functions uh, versus the nonlinear components. Um, since these were a lot of simulations, we needed a lot of horsepower so that we can run these simulations. Running them on our own machines would have would take us a very long period of time, but running them on a stampede um, uh, as, as part of uh, uh, the simulations that we've conducted, and uh, we were able to run them in really fast uh, period of time. Um, we were around 3.6 million analyses. It, it was actually 1.2 million of each of equivalent linear, nonlinear, and linear analyses. Uh, resulted in about 10 terabytes of data, and uh, we then had to store this in a uh, NoSQL Mongo database uh, that is currently, and I think, private mode on design safe, but will be soon available uh, broadly uh, as soon as we get the paper out as well. Um, the total time that it took us was around eight days, which was really nice. It takes time to generate the input files for these types of analyses. Uh, and we ended up using HPC as well to generate those. And we had available 2,000 cores. Yeah. So we have this valuable data set, and we wanted to get the most out of it. And of course, we would like to thank Design Safe uh, Cyber Infrastructure facilities for allowing us to and facilitating these kind of simulations. This gives you a sense of the space of we cover in these simulations. Um, on the horizontal axis is the VS30, and on the vertical axis is the linear response spectrum amplification at 0.1 second here, uh, as well as the total response uh, spectrum amplification. And the shading tells you how the number of simulations we have. You can see we have a lot of simulations within the body of uh, the data. At the periphery, of course, we have fewer simulations. And that has important implications when you're trying to develop models. Uh, models can work well with data. And if you have fewer data, they can potentially um, result in misfits or in behavior that you may find uh, can be challenging or problematic. Um, this is a, the site response or site amplification is complex and therefore we have a lot of trends that we uh, identified there and we need to capture them via robust models. So our search, our focus was to have robust models that can capture the nuances of the simulation data, so that these models become more reliable, uh, are better for the users. So in our research, we developed many different models. Um, depending on the inputs, we have VS30 only models. We found these to be actually uh, limited in terms of their uh, fit of the data. By adding the natural period to the data, we found significant improvement in the fit with the data. And uh, this is both for conventional model as well as artificial neural network models. Our models were both response spectrum models as well as Fourier amplification spectrum models because in the future, as we move forward, we see the future whereby uh, GMMs will be more Fourier amplitude based as opposed to response spectrum uh, based. And so our models can be then used with either families. Uh, then when we are looking at intensity measures, we have uh, many different uh, parameters that we have used. Uh, I'm not going, for the purpose of the presentation today, I'm going to focus only on two models. For the linear models, we're going to work models whereby the input is VS30 and TNAT. 
And for the nonlinear models, it's VS30, TNAT, and PGA. These are the models we have. We use the term L5 and then L5 plus N2. And for artificial neural networks, you'll see the term AL5 or AT5. So these are the models we are working and we are interested in seeing what can you capture with one versus the other. So um, first with the linear models, um, this is the L5 model and it was, we had, we added some features to that model compared to what we had before from the uh, Harmon et al. model. So we have more variables, the 10 variables relative to eight variables in terms of doing the fitting. So we wanted to have um, had to do more complexity in the uh, function, in, these fun in this model function, so that we can have better fit of the data. A VS30 time average VS to a depth of 30 meters. TNAT is the site natural period. R and G are equal uh, wavelet and Gaussian terms, respectively. Um, so now we're going to look a little bit about the, at the data. This is the VS30 versus linear response spectrum. This is the simulation. This is the bind mean. And here we're looking at the L5 models only. And then this is the data, what, what the L5 model prediction would uh, give us. And you will see that here, it is not really uh, doing a good, good job at capturing a peak in the response uh, for, corresponding to the, this range of VS30s. And this is for an oscillator period of 0.1 second. And this is the root mean square error of our data. Um, we will start comparing the different models root mean square errors so that we can get a sense how the different models are performing. We're also going to look at the residuals of the data. So here, for example, is are the residuals of the L5 model, the linear model. Um, the uh, teal color here shows you the spread in the residuals, and these are the bin means. The bin means in this, say, uh, region of VS30, you're seeing that it is centered around zero, which is, you know, it's good, something we like. Uh, but in other areas here for these VS30s uh, and this range of VS30s, we're actually off. This is for an oscillator period of 0.1 second. And then for one second, we are seeing some deviation from zero. And you really like to be close to zero or you like to be centered uh, around zero for the best fit. So now let's look at models whereby now we add the uh, a nonlinear component. And this is again with the conventional models that we are working with. And we are seeing here that the models, uh, we added complexity uh, compared to prior models, uh, but the models are using the original forms for Xuan Yang's or Sehan uh, and Sehan and Stewart as well. So now let's look at the performance of these conventional models. The gray data is the data itself, spread data, the spread in the data. Uh, this is the bind mean of the data plus or minus sigma. And then this is the conventional model uh, predi predictions um, from after uh, fitting the data. You will see here when we look at now the residuals of the data, we're really not centered around zero. We are seeing significant scatter, whether at 0.1 second or one second. So this is a concern for us is that, you know, can we do better? I mean, these are still good models. It's not that they are, and, and they are a significant improvement over everything we have, we have had before. But the question is, and we're always in search of, can we do better? Um, this is a comparison of root mean square error of the models that uh, a harm, um, Ilhan et al. Did, performed, which is the L5 model versus the Harmon et al. And you see, really, we're not seeing, uh, we're seeing some improvement here, but also maybe some deterioration in this range. So there is really limited reduction, even though we try to use um, improvement in the functional forms. Overall, it's about, it's pretty similar um and between the two between the previous model and the current model in terms of the root mean square error and there was issues with the how we constrain the coefficient behavior that led to some minor limited increases here so that got us thinking well how about we try using a um 
uh, neural network based models. Um, I have used uh, models for material constitutive uh, modeling uh, for soils, for deep excavations beforehand. And I thought, you know, let's try them here. Let's see how we can do that. And uh, so, you know, we, we, we can keep on trying adding var variables to our models, but actually it's really not a solution for us. So this way we decided to say, okay, let's try using deep learning models. Uh, as I've mentioned, same uh, inputs. Um, the neural networks are a collection of interconnected artificial nodes, uh, sort of trying to emulate or represent how our brain works, neurons. And every time you learn something, you have connectivity between these. And what you're really working on are the weights and the biases uh, as you update the models iteratively. And but the input and the output as a user, you would not see any difference. In our case, we use 90% of the simulation for training 10% to test the predictive capability. Uh, we selected to have two hidden layers. Uh, these are some statistics on the learning. We used uh, a, uh, the Google Brain Team's work, uh, product, TensorFlow, for our neural network. They are highly optimized and you can uh, carry them I uh, use them both on a desktop as well as on HPC machines. Uh, the outputs are the same as we have had for the conventional models. So now let's look a little bit about the comparison between the conventional models and of artificial neural network. And we'll start first with linear models only. This is our data, linear uh, RS uh, amplification, VS30. Uh, mind you, these models use both VS30 and TNAT as uh, input. Uh, but here I'm only showing the data versus VS30. Uh, the bend mean of bend mean of the data. This is the data from a conventional model, and then here's our data with a uh, artificial neural network. You're, we're really doing much better capturing the sense of the of the data, the spread in the data. And uh, we're also looking, seeing better representation of the weathered rock zone. Uh, they seem to be a more compatible uh, or more representative of the range of the data we're encountering. This is now looking at the total uh, data set. Uh, this is the total amplification, which includes nonlinear effects. This is the bin mean of the data itself. Uh, this is the conventional data. And now we're looking at an artificial neural network data. You're seeing we're seeing a better trend that represents the changes in the data. And here is one way of looking at it. There are also other ways of looking at it. We're seeing similar improvement. Uh, we also did, did the same thing with now. These were response spectrum models. These were for Fourier amplitude spectrum model. And again, we are seeing um, better representation, better capture of the trends with artificial neural networks conventional and artificial neural network for Fourier amplitude models. This is now the total, total models. If we look now at the residuals, this is the residuals from our uh, artificial neural, uh, from, sorry, the conventional models with artificial neural network, we're actually centered on zero. It is remarkable how well centered is our, our, our residuals around zero, superior to our conventional models. So that is something that is we really like to see. We're seeing lower uh, spread dispersion of the residuals compared to, say, the conventional models. So it is, of course, it doesn't take it down to zero, but they were seeing significant improvement there. Now, if you look at the root mean square error, systematically, whether we're looking at the linear amplification or the total amplification, which captures nonlinearity, we're seeing systematic reduction in the root mean square error, 21 to 27% reduction, which is significant when you're dealing with the Lin amplification, a natural logarithm of amplification. So that's a significant improvement, which we think is really makes these models promising. Uh, now we wanted to see how these models perform uh, when we are looking at the shallower sites, and this is in the eastern part of the United States, there are sites which are have very shallow profiles. So we wanted to see how these would, would, would perform, how our models would perform. And so I'm going to uh, 
I recognize I'm limited on time. So this is uh, the data itself, uh, not the not the simulation yet, showing us uh, how the data, the simulation data we have, uh, and and for shallow we sorted out, we removed all the deeper sites and we focused on the shallower sites, less than 30 meters in depth. And then we looked at the, the site amplification um, uh, bin means. Then we looked at the conventional models and then we looked at the artificial neural network. Just to show you here, this is the conventional models and then this is the artificial neural network. The artificial neural networks are following the bin means very, very well without having to do anything special for them. It really, the neural network has sufficient power to capture that representation of the data. It can capture peaks. Uh, now, then we looked at for specific sites uh, in New York City, and this is showing us the representation with the conventional model being the blue line, and then with the artificial neural network, um, and we're able to capture the peak in the response. Uh, this is again with the blue, and then um, and you can see a shift in the peak, and then you see the artificial neural network. We're seeing some shift here, but it is less severe than uh, for um, this level of shaking. So we're seeing a significant improvement. So now that takes me to my concluding remarks here. Uh, we generated a large database of site amplification simulation uh, data, uh, for equivalent linear, nonlinear, and linear analyses, and this will be available to the community. We use conventional uh, response spectrum site amplification models that we are quite familiar with and comfortable with. We found that there is a limit in terms of how much you can reduce the root mean square error. We kind of hit a floor there. Um, and when we introduce the artificial networks, we saw a significant decrease in the root, mons, uh, root mean square error. And we saw this better representation for site amplification attributes that are relevant for Central and Eastern North America. I should caution you, artificial neural networks, like conventional models, have uh, limitations. For example, they are not very good at extrapolation unless you constrain them uh, via, say, for example, physically-based models or data. Um, nevertheless, I think they represent a very promising uh, alternative. I believe it's the future of learning and representing large data sets, even when we have uh, not just simulation data, when we have data that is measured uh, as we acquire more and more data, artificial neural networks will be there, will be very helpful. And many of the speakers uh, spoke about some of these uh, promising trends as well. Uh, and at the end of the day, I'd say, regardless of the choice, whether you use for conventional or artificial network net networks um, for site amplification models, they are really not a substitute for site-specific studies. And uh, we, I would always encourage everyone to consider that in addition to the use of these models. And with that, I think I've reached my time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Professor Hishash. Let me go ahead and share my screen again real quick, and I'll introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is Professor Jorge Macedo from Georgia Institute of Technology, and he's going to be speaking about machine learning-based procedures for estimating seismically induced slope displacements. So please help me in welcoming Professor Macedo. Thank you for the introduction. I'm gonna be sharing my screen and hopefully uh, you can see it. Could you confirm if my screen can be seen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, perfect. There was a little bit of echo over there. Well, um, first of all, I'd like to start by uh, by actually acknowledging the uh, organizing committee and also to thank uh, uh, Jorge Meneses, Dr. Meneses for uh, inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, today I'm gonna be sharing a little bit of our work on uh, seismically induced uh, uh, slope displacements on having actually mature le learning-based procedures for estimating them. 
Uh, I have to acknowledge also the, the, the funding by the United States Geological Survey that has uh, supported uh, this work. And I want to also acknowledge uh, uh, Dr. Norman, Norman Abrahamson, uh, uh, Professor Jonathan Ray, uh, Professor Yusef Bassoni, and also Dr. Sylvia Mazzoni, who uh, have been also instrumental on discussions and also on supporting part of the work. So uh, having said that, uh, this is going to be the outline of the of the presentation, uh, I would I will be starting with an introduction. Then uh, I'm going to be moving into actually discussing the motivation and looking at different tectonic settings. As you will be seeing during the presentation, we are looking at uh, shallow crustal and subduction settings. Uh, then I will be uh, discussing on the future selection for the models that we have put forward, and uh, to move into the development of the machine learning base methods, the assessment that we have performed, and uh, and I will be just uh, concluding after that. So first of all, in terms of the introduction, uh, I think uh, it's important to highlight uh, the relevance of seismically induced slope displacements. Uh, there are many studies that have highlighted how important they are in terms of the damage that could be caused after uh, earthquakes. So here on the on this slide, you're seeing just a couple of examples. One is on the Kumamoto earthquake in 2016 on the left, and another one from the Salvador earthquake in 2001. So there is a significant literature actually highlighting the value of, or, or sorry, the potential damage that landslides, earthquake induced landslides to be more specific can cause. So uh, in that context, uh, proper planning for hazard mitigation is going to require a proper evaluation of of the of some performance index, and that is basically what the, the seismically induced displacement estimates that are going to be discussed are. They are as a performance index to try to have um, an assessment on what, on what is the expected performance of a slope system in general. So uh, if we move a little bit, <coughs> excuse me, into what, uh, what are the engineering applications? Because uh, the estimation of seismically induced displacements are also uh, used often on engineering projects. The problem is going to be typically posted as it is uh, so used on this slide. You will be having an earth uh, waste or a natural slope system. It could be a, a water dam, it could be a hip niche pad, it could be a tailings dam, it could be a slope system. And uh, at the design stage, uh, an engineer needs to have an estimate on what's going to be the expected amount of seismic and induced displacements to actually relate that to the expected performance of that system when it is shaken by, by a design earthquake, which typically is going to be associated to a return period as well. So um, now, uh, moving uh, a little bit into highlighting the, the importance of different tectonic settings. This is just a schematic figure, kind of showing, uh, for example, uh, the, the shallow crossal tectonic setting like California. And uh, we are going to be having also the other tectonic settings, like, for example, the interface earthquakes, which are associated to the contact between tectonic plates, and uh, the interslap events, which are going to be typically occurring in depth on, on an area that is more related to the rupture of the slab, of the subducting slab, and not necessarily with a, with a contact uh, with, with another uh, tectonic plate. So uh, historically, most of the models available out there for estimating seismically induced displacements have been formulated for shallow crossing earthquakes. So uh, indeed, uh, we can go back to the, to the 80s to see the first models, uh, for example, the, the work by Magdis and Sid. Uh, comparatively speaking, the, the models that are available for subduction tectonic settings are scarce. And uh, with, uh, working with Professor Ray during my PhD, we developed uh, a model for subduction interface tectonic settings under what I would be describing more uh, classical approaches, kind of mixed mix effects regressions. And one of the motivations here has been uh, also to expand that and to look at machine learning to try to expand models uh, on, the, on these three tectonic settings, on shallow crossal interface, subduction interface, and also subduction interest map. So um, continuing on that, he has, uh, he has wanted to share a couple of figures over here. The figure in the left is uh, basically showing on the y-axis the residuals of different models. Uh, and the models that are plotted over there 
are uh, what is indicated as BT07 was the original model by Brian Trovasaro. And uh, when you look at that model, and, uh, and by the way, the data that is generated over here is uh, data on soft action interface tectonic settings. When you look at the model that was generated for shadow cross, uh, like the, the BT07 model, you will be seeing some residuals, as you can notice, for example, from that plot. If you look at the, the blue curve, you will be seeing that there are some residuals when the model is evaluated against uh, subduction data. So that is indicating that there are uh, some uh, trends that uh, a model formulated for shadow cross tectonic settings is just not capturing uh, on the case of subduction tectonic settings. Uh, the same uh, the same comment can be uh, done for the other uh, trends, which uh, I, which the only difference is that the receivers are being plotted against the fundamental period here, and again the earthquake magnitude over here. So um, that's one thing I wanted to highlight. So uh, actually on, on the paper that we published on, on 2018, something that we did was to kind of try to speculate in some way what could be the fundamental aspects that are actually differentiating um, earthquakes and subduction uh, tectonic settings from shadow uh, crossal settings. And something that we saw is kind of illustrated on this plot on the, on the right. The y-axis is just spectral acceleration, and the x-axis is just fundamental period. And these are two uh, response spectra uh, that are just normalized. They, they have been normalized at, that, uh, at a given period over here, just because that is the degraded period um, that we were considering. And uh, what you can see when you compare them, by the way, the, the black one is, uh, mm -hmm. is a response spectra calculated with a ground motion model for subduction tectonic settings, and the the brown one is uh, is one for shadow crustal. So what you can see is that there is uh, the spectral amplitudes, comparatively speaking, once you normalize them, they are larger for the shadow crustal earthquake. So given a uh, fixed magnitude and distance, what you would be seeing is that typically shallow crustal uh, recordings are going to be causing more uh, displacements compared to subduction uh, type earthquakes. But I want to highlight that this is only if you are normalizing that and only if you have the same magnitude and uh, same distance. Of course, subduction earthquakes typically are going to be associated to larger magnitudes, and then that, that's a different history. And that observation is what is uh, kind of highlighted on the left. If you can see the, the, the blue curve over here, for example, you will be seeing that the residuals are negative, which basically means that the shallow cross time model was kind of uh, providing higher estimates for this subduction data. So, um, okay, so um, until here, basically, yes, uh, I wanted to highlight the motivation into looking at different tectonic settings. Now, um, just to uh, wrap up the introduction part and the, and the general uh, framework, uh, I want to talk briefly also about the previous works that have been performed on estimating uh, the seismically induced slope displacements. And this is uh, what I would, what I'm going to be kind of describing within the classical approaches, and those are basically uh, based on developing uh, displacement data using Newman sliding block methods, and there are different options for doing that uh, using couple or the couple analysis in general. For example, here uh, on this illustration, you are seeing uh, on the top part, you're seeing what the couple analysis is where basically you calculate the dynamic response of your slope system. And then after the dynamic response is calculated, you use that dynamic response as an input to actually calculate what's going to be the sliding response and then to calculate the displacements from that response. So that is the, that those are the decoupled models. And uh, hopefully you can see my mouse. Otherwise, let me just put the pointer. Okay. So those are the decoupled models, and there are many of them. Uh, as I was saying, this in seed perhaps is one of the pioneer models in that direction. Then we have uh, Professor Ellen Raji at UT Austin. She has developed also uh, a large suite of models. Uh, there are some models developed by the USGS, by, uh, by Gibson, by Dr. Gibson. And uh, the other family uh, is the coupled models. In the coupled models, you have that the dynamic response and the sliding response is calculated at the same time. 
And then you are estimating the displacement at the same time that you are calculating the dynamic response. There is also there are also several models that have been developed um, under that conditions, like for example, uh, Graham Travasaro, uh, Duetal, and uh, we recently also updated the Graham Travasaro 2007 model uh, using a, lar a larger database. So um, now. Uh, Kind of uh, in going towards the the machine learning based models, I wanted also to put kind of a comparison between uh, the traditional approaches and also the data driven approaches that have been used for or that when in the context of formulating seismically induced uh, slope displacement. So uh, first of all, in terms of traditional approaches, typically those models have been based on polynomials and typically on linear or Nonlinear mixed effects regressions, and in some cases, uh, the probability of having negative displacements have been part of the model, for which things like logistic regression or probit regressions have been used. On the data-driven approach, we have um, uh, different options, as I'm going to be showing later, and also as different speakers have been highlighting during uh, the different talks today. We can use uh, Gauss Gaussian uh, random fields, late, latent Gaussian Markov random field, Bayesian hierarchy models, artificial neural network networks, and uh, other options. So uh, in terms of the inference on the traditional approach, it is typically based on maximum li likelihood estimators or, or ordinary least squares. And uh, in terms of the data-driven approaches, we can have a, a maximum a posteriori fully Bayesian, empirical Bayesian iteratively uh, railway list squares and restricted my maximum likelihood, just to name a few. Uh, in terms of feature selection, what typically uh, what was typically the case with the traditional approaches, it was in some way based on engineering judgment and also on some iteration with uh, yes by changing features and, and by trying to decrease the standard deviation of what's going to be the, the the final model. On the data-driven approach, uh, you can have more uh, robust feature selection algorithms. I'm going to be showing some of them or discussing some of them later, and I think uh, different speakers have also discussed them uh, during the day. Uh, for uncertainty quantification, you could do bootstrapping uh, on the traditional approach, or you can just estimate the standard deviation. In terms of bootstrapping, bootstrapping it could be uh, a bit inefficient if you uh, go to complex models. For the data driven, you could do posterior distributions, things like that. And for the predictive performance, uh, it's going to be often, the traditional models are going to be often constrained by the performance of the poly polynomial models because they are usually based on polynomials. In the case of the data driven models, or machine learning based models, they could increase, the performance could increase significantly, especially on regions with, with data. Uh, when they are compared with polynomial based models. So I want to highlight the, the, the part of the regions with data because uh, something uh, where I think caution should be ex exerted when you are using machine learning models is extrapolation. I'll, I'll be discuss discussing a little bit more on that later. So uh, on this slide, I, I just want to kind of uh, finalize uh, uh, the, the review of the previous uh, uh, empirical, semi-empirical models, the classical models. As I said, typically fixed functional forms either linear or second order polynomials and the feature selection is just, yes, uh, for instance, you have, let's say three intensity measures that you believe are gonna be actually explanatory of the response that you're looking after. And you start to change them iteratively and you see which one is kind of decreasing more the standard deviation, for example. So uh, the disadvantages of doing that is that capturing some complex relationships is gonna be challenging as um, exactly the same message that uh, Professor Hashash was uh, showing on the previous talk and uh, talking on amplification. So there are going to be some disadvantages uh, on that sense. The, the, the performance is, is, is uh, in some cases, is just not going to be uh, scalable. So you don't have a better performance necessarily if you start to add features. And then, uh, as I said, the feature selection uh, is not robust. So in that context, uh, machine learning uh, provides advantages to handle complex relationships, and it's going to be also providing uh, computational efficiency. As uh, I think there was an example in one of the previous talks uh, where uh, this, the computation time was uh, significantly reduced uh, by using uh, neural networks. So 
indeed, you can have that uh, uh, advantages. And uh, you can also treat uncertainties uh, in a robust way. However, uh, they may be machine learning methods, they may be, uh, they have to be used with caution, especially for, for the extrapolation part, as I was saying. I completely agree that we need uh, physics-based machine learning models. There is an entire field doing research on that area on physics-based machine learning. I think, uh, for example, in the case of earthquakes, and uh, if you, th there are going to be many cases where you have a large magnitude, uh, or I would say very few data on large magnitude earthquakes at, at uh, short distances. If you are just training your model with uh, data that is at, uh, let's say, moderate uh, distances and small magnitudes, then you have to be very careful on how that, those models are going to be extrapolating to, uh, to large magnitudes and short distances, which, by the way, are the scenarios where typically we are, uh, we are doing design. So uh, machine learning is a great tool, but uh, at the same time, I think we have to be also uh, trying, to be as, trying to bring as much physics as we can when we can. So uh, now, having said that, let me uh, kind of discuss a little bit more on the models that we have formulated. So we have, a, we did the models in two steps. First of all, we, we did the, the feature selection, and then we moved into the, the, the prediction models themselves. For the feature selection, uh, I'm gonna be just discussing some, some of the methods that we used, like for example, the forward back, backward stepwise selection where you just start to uh, kind of look at the features that could be helping to train the model iteratively uh, better. And we used also random forest and also lasso uh, to, to determine the, the importance of each feature. Something else we did is to look at the family of models. You have to try to have a trade-off between interpretability and also flexibility. This is just a, a, a picture showing that where you, when you increase your flexibility, you're gonna be having less inter interpretability. So um, in terms of our prediction models, we did develop 19 models for shallow cross cell earthquakes and 10 models, five for interface and five for uh, interest lab in terms of subduction settings. We did use the uh, machine learning techniques that are uh, listed here, like pr principal component regression, partial data square regression, Retrogression with polynomial feature expansion, uh, generalized linear model, support vector machines, or support vector regression uh, for, the reg for the regression part. Uh, with kernel approximation, that was uh, something that we were exploring. Also the GBDT, random forest, Gaussian kernel regression, and also artificial networks, and specifically the ResNet. So uh, the details of, uh, of all of these, I'm not going to be able to cover all the details because of the time constraints, but if you are interested, this has been already published on, on two papers on soil dynamics and earthquake engineering, and also there is a report that is uh, perhaps is already public, I'm not sure, but that there is a report uh, from the USES that we submitted as well for those that are interested in the details. So now, um, having said that, those are the, the techniques that we're going to be using. Let me talk a little bit about the data. So uh, in terms of data, we did uh, consider the three tectonic settings that I was describing before. Uh, here I'm just showing illustrations of the distribution of the magnitude and the rupture distance for the three tectonic settings. Uh, for instance, for the shallow crustal, we did consider 6,711 uh, uh, recordings. For the interface, it was 6,240. And for the interest lab, it was uh, about 8,300 uh, recordings. And we used uh, those recordings to uh, generate uh, displacements. For instance, our database, I'm gonna be talking a little bit more about that later. Our database for uh, shallow cross it was about uh, 3 million. Likewise, for uh, interface and for interest lab, it was about 4.5 million uh, displacements. The other, uh, uh, parameters, which uh, in, in terms of the machine learning language, they're going to be as denominating as feature candidates. The other parameters that we have used actually to parameterize what's the response of an slope system were uh, the yield coefficient and also the fundamental period. They are just uh, uh, schematically illustrated over here. Basically, the yield coefficient is just representing the resistance that an slope system has to actually start on a sliding. 
So uh, it's going to be related to the strength of the sliding mass. Typically, it is estimated in, in, in practice through a pseudo-static analysis, where you're going to be having a, a the, the KY over here is representing that. For, in that particular case, for example, this slope system is going to be having a KY of 0 0.1. And uh, we have also the fundamental period that's going to be a parameter to, to parameterize the response of the slope. And this is representing the flexibility of the sliding mass. So depending if you have a rigid or a flexible slope, the, the response is going to be significantly uh, different. So um, that was something important to highlight. But we need to also parameterize some uh, you know, information about an arc with ground motion. And uh, typically, an uh, acceleration time history is going to be uh, represented by intensity measures. Here I'm just showing three of them, like the PGA, the peak ground acceleration, to kind of characterize the amplitude, the TM, which is just the mean period to, to characterize the frequency content, and the duration to characterize the duration. So we're going to be having a whole bunch of, of features, as I'm going to be showing uh, in a little bit. Something else that we did pay attention to was the, were the spectral accelerations. So initial, if you look at the model, for example, by uh, Brian Trovasaro, you will be seeing that the, there was a degraded period, uh, a spectral acceleration at a degraded period, to be more precise, that was selected as an optimal intensity measure to estimate displacements. And uh, the reasoning on having a degraded period is because there is going to be a nonlinearity that is imposed on a soil mass when it is affected by an airport. So something that we did uh, take a look was to actually investigate different uh, degraded periods on a spectral acceleration. So here I'm just showing a kind of three of them just schematically. So, um, okay, so um, now what we did with this parameterization was to uh, use uh, a, the, the stick slip model uh, developed by Raji and Bray, which was uh, later modified uh, in, in a paper in Bray et al. 2018, just to to, to make it uh, numerically more stable. And we did uh, use all of our earthquakes in the database to actually generate uh, slope displacements by uh, performing a, a couple of stick slip slope uh, displacement analysis. So uh, here I am showing uh, just uh, how it's the typical distribution of these displacements. For example, uh, in the left plot you are seeing on the x-axis is the spectral acceleration at a degraded period 1.3. And here, uh, what you are seeing is the PGB. And as you can see, as the PGB increases and the spectral acceleration increases, displacements are going to be increasing. Here you are seeing magnitude and rupture distance. With, with an increase in magnitude, displacements are going to tend to increase. With an increase uh, of rupture distance, uh, that's going to be the opposite. Displacements are going to tend to decrease. And you can see here also the, the how displacement change with fundamental period and with the yield coefficient. So if, as the yield coefficient increases, displacements are going to decrease. The effect is not going to be as significant on the fundamental period, but still on areas close to 0 0.2 to 0 0.4, there is going to be kind of a reason and condition that then is going to be, uh, that condition is going to be decreasing as you increase the fundamental period. Just as a summary of the features that we considered, all of them are listed over here. KY and TS, to re they represent the, the slope system. And then we have a bunch of features to represent intensity measures or also spectral accelerations or earthquake characteristics and also site conditions. So um, with those features, what we have done is to first conduct a, a future selection. And here I'm showing the results for a shallow crustal with three uh, a future selection algorithms just to illustrate this. So uh, as you can see, the forward selection is, uh, is, is selecting these, uh, these uh, parameters over here. And lasso is selecting more parameters and random forest is, uh, is, is selecting uh, the same number of parameters as forward selection, but uh, actually one more, but uh, significantly less than lasso. However, when you start to look at the production accuracy in terms of the number of features that you are, that you are selecting, you will be seeing that beyond five, there may not be a significant increase actually in the prediction accuracy. So that's one, one comment that I want to highlight. So we repeated that for um, uh, the, the previous slide was, by the way, for shadow crosser. We repeated that for interface and also for interest lab. And again, there was kind of a, a number of features between four and five beyond which um, the accuracy was not increasing. So uh, we did a look uh, also uh, to the feature selection using Lasso. 
I'm not going to be getting into the details that was already discussed by other speakers, I believe, uh, on previous um, uh, talks, but the features that were selected are here on the bottom part. And we did that also with Random Forest. And here, just a, a summary of the of the features that were selected with forward, uh, lasso and random forest for uh, just illustrating that and subduction settings for interface and interest map. So something I want to also clarify here is in the case of the shadow crossal, we had more or less consistency across the different methods. So here we had to do some uh, judgment because uh, in some cases, random forest, for instance, was selecting uh, say at 1.0 and also say, say at 1.3. But those uh, spectral accelerations are highly correlated. So we finally just yes, uh, decided to actually go with magnitude, in magnitude instead of that. I'll be happy to discuss the details during the, the Q&A session, just yes, to keep things on time. And uh, we we just yes, um, uh, went uh, ahead with magnitude. So these features are uh, representing properties of the slope, are representing also uh, properties of the ground motion, like for example, amplitude. Magnitude is going to be bringing some information on duration. And then PGV, for instance, brings some, in, uh, some information on frequency content. And spectral acceleration also brings information on amplitude. Uh, just as an example, uh, this is showing a, a, a random forest regressor. I think Professor Kumar did an excellent job on the morning describing uh, how it works. And I will be, as, uh, to keep thing, things on time, I will be uh, saying that there is an initial phase of a bootstrapping. This is just showing an example for 100 um, bootstrapping samples. Then is, there is going to be a random feature sampling. We are going to be building the, the learning trees, and then we are going to be doing the aggregation at the end for having our estimates. So uh, we did use the standard uh, cross-validation procedures, where basically we have um, case samples. Um, we, we did use, by the way, it was a 10-fold uh, cross-validation, which means that we had uh, nine groups of, of data and we, we that we used for the estimation, and then we used the remaining one, the, the 10, for the validation, and we repeated that k times. And uh, after doing that, we quantified the cross-validation error, which is just schematically shown here. This is for shallow cross town earthquakes, where you are seeing uh, there are 19 models over here. And uh, a traditional model uh, is shown for reference over here would be the, the model 20. So most of our uh, machine learning models, at least in terms of cross-validation error, were kind of uh, outperforming the, the traditional one. And uh, here it is important uh, just to highlight that uh, through the cross-validation, what we do, what we did is also to tune our hyperparameters. And I'm, by the way, I'm going back and forth between shallow cross and subduction just to show, to illustrate some uh, points. You can see the details in the papers. And uh, this slide is showing the hyperparameters for the subduction models. In the case of the root regression, random forest, GBDT, SVR, and also the resonant. Uh, probably one of the models that was more difficult to train, and there is some entire discussion on that on our paper, and this publishes the resonant, because we had to, uh, my student, Jin Liu, that is, I think, he, he gets the credit for that. He actually modified a bit the, the, the neural network and customized it for this problem. So uh, anyways, uh, until here, what uh, basically what uh, I want to highlight is that we uh, generated uh, a large amount of simulations, and we generated also a significant a large number of models using machine learning methods. But something that we, we wanted to do was also to evaluate how these models are performing in case histories, and also how they are uh, extrapolating. So um, I'm going to be talking a, a little bit about that in the next few minutes. This slide is just showing the case histories that we used that were compiled by Brian Trobasaro and Brian in 2019. Those are just case histories uh, of uh, observation of seismically induced displacements called after case, after important earthquakes. So uh, this slide is just showing a subset of the derivations that we did or the verifications that we did. For example, this is a random forest and there are 13 case histories. So typically, you can see that the models, when you have small displacements, uh, by the way, the red one is observed and the blue one is predicted. When you have small observed displacements, they are performing relatively fine. In all cases, you can see this one also and also this one, which is good because you want to finally, what you want to get is an index of performance. Uh, that, that's actually uh, positive. So there were a few cases like here where there were some particularly uh, effects probably associated with the reactivity effects 
that uh, none of the models were actually capturing properly, non the traditional, non the machine learning based. Anyways, what we did was to define a metric that was just based on the difference between the observation in the case history and the prediction of the model. And based on that metric, we evaluate the different models. Again, the model, the traditional model is model 20. So also here, there are several machine learning based models that are outperforming that model. Importantly, we check how the machine learning models are actually extrapolating. What you're seeing on these plots, the continuous line is the machine learning model and the dotted line is a traditional model that is based on a fixed polynomial. So uh, generally, the models were uh, performing, were extrapolating appropriately, and we were happy with that. But it is an important check. Uh, and this is showing just the same, but for the subduction uh, setting, where uh, also the models were uh, extrapolating appropriately. And also something that I wanted to highlight for the interface model, when we compare our estimates against the shallow crustal for the same magnitude and same distance and same inputs, the shallow crustal was providing higher estimates, which makes sense based on what I was describing before on the long period content on shallow crustal outputs. So uh, using all of that information, what we did is to evaluate the performance of our models. So we used first the MSC, which is just the cross-validation error. We used case histories. We were judging, we were giving a score to the models that were uh, actually able to predict the, deposit, the, the performance in an appropriate way. That means basically no displacements when there was, a, a, I would say, a, an appropriate performance and then displacement when it was not. So uh, then we also uh, give a ranking to the trends based on what we would be expecting physically. And we sum up them to come up with a cumulative uh, score. And uh, we did also evaluate the number of features. Most of our models had five features, but we wanted to evaluate also a larger number of features, and we went up to 21. Based on that, we uh, recommended uh, four different models. This is for shallow crustal, and you can see something similar for subduction settings. Yes, uh, uh, closing the presentation, uh, first of all, I want to highlight that the, the features that we selected, um, among them, we have the yield coefficient and the fundamental period to represent the, the properties of the slope. And the other features like magnitude, PGV, and SA at 1.3 are attempting to represent actually features of a ground motion like uh, amplitude, duration, and frequency content. The models uh, that we uh, were assessed actually uh, from different angles, it was not only the cross-validation error that would be perhaps purely data-driven, but we actually wanted to evaluate their performance on case histories and, uh, and also the trends. So we did check that extrapolation was reasonable, and we did also check that they were performing in a reasonable way on case histories to actually give confidence to engineers for using them. In terms of shallow cross and tectonic settings, the, the models that we uh, are recommending are uh, in the second order polynomial with linear interactions that are just yes, provided by the machine learning algorithm. Also, second order polynomial with linear and square uh, interactions, a multi order model, and a Gaussian, called, uh, Gaussian kernel regression. In the case of subduction sounds, we are recommending the GBDT, random forest, the ResNet, and also this, the SVR support the vector regression model. And yes, uh, last but not least, uh, it's important to highlight that most of the machine learning techniques exhibited actually a better capability in learning and inferring the complicated interrelations compared to traditional uh, the traditional counterparts. However, we have to be careful on, uh, on using them, especially uh, when we are dealing with extrapolation problems. So with that, I'm going to be uh, finishing and thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Professor Matiba. All right, up next, we have Professor Hiroyuki Miura from Hiroshima University, and his presentation is Application of AI Technology for Estimating Site Amplification Factor from Micro Tremor Horizontal to Vertical Spectral Ratio. Okay, so can you hear me? Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, good morning from Japan. Uh, first of all, I'd like to appreciate the invitation of the, uh, this colloquium. Uh, I'm Hiroyuki Mira from Hiroshima University, Japan. Today, I'd like to introduce our recent research application of AI technology for estimating site amplification factor from microtremor HRV spectral ratio. 
So today's topic is already published in the, uh, our journal paper in BSSA, as shown here. So please look the original article if you have an interest in on my talk. Okay, let's begin. Uh, first, uh, I'd like to explain the uh, seismic wave propagation from source to site. This figure shows the uh, uh, schematic diagram of the seismic wave propagation. The so ground motion at the surface can be represented by the convolution of source, path, and uh, site effects, as shown in this equation in frequency domain. So in this, uh, this study focused on the site effect as known as, uh, uh, also known as uh, uh, site amplification of seismic waves. So first, uh, let me introduce the, what is site amplification factor. So our uh, first speaker, uh, Professor Hashash, already introduced, but uh, uh, let me uh, introduce this topic. So uh, site amplification factor, SAF, uh, we call in this study. So this is site-specific and uh, frequency dependent. So as shown in the left figure, uh, site amplification factor, SAF, is represented as the relationship between the frequency and amplification of typically a S wave at the surface ground from bedrock. So in this study, the bedrock is uh, defined as the shear wave velocity of approximately 3000 meters per second. So SAF is generally determined by the soil condition of uh, approximately several hundred meters to several kilometer depths. So uh, SAF strongly controls amplitude of the ground motion. It means that the SAF significantly affects the seismic behaviors of structures, such as low-rise buildings in high, higher frequency and the higher uh, uh, high-rise buildings in lower frequencies. In the previous uh, approaches, uh, generally, the deep borehole data and or uh, long-term seismic observation records are required to evaluate the uh, uh, site amplification factors. Uh, for example, the, uh, if we obtain the borehole data, we will estimate the shear wave velocity profiles and uh, uh, apply the 1D theory to obtain the site amplification factor. On the other hand, the, uh, if we have a uh, lot of uh, seismic observation, observation records, we can apply the spectral inversion technique to uh, uh, obtain the empirical site amplification factors. But uh, these approaches are costly and time consuming. On the other hand, the microtrema data uh, has been used to uh, the site characterizations. So especially, the microtrema array observations have been widely used to estimate the shear wave velocity profiles and evaluate the site amplification factors. But uh, these approaches uh, have the, uh, some uncertainties in estimating the site amplification factors, uh, sorry, the shear, uh, shear wave velocity profiles and the damping factors. So oh, this study, is, uh, we try to directly estimate the uh, site amplification factor without any a priori information uh, to estimate the site amplification factor using deep neural networks. Microtremors, uh, ambient vibration of grounds, have been widely used for site characterization as uh, introduced in the previous slide. Especially microtrema horizontal to vertical spectral ratio in frequency domain, we call MHVR, uh, has been used in characterizing the side effects. So uh, the detail of this uh, technique uh, will be introduced later, but uh, uh, this approach is it, the calculation of the MHVRs. So let me introduce uh, some literatures of MHVR studies. Uh, several wave propagation theories of microtremors have been proposed and um, applied for site characterization, such as the surface wave theory uh, in Arai and Tokimatsu 2004, and uh, recently the uh, 
proposed diffused field assumption uh, in Sanchez Sesma 2070, but they adopted the following steps in evaluating the site amplification factors from microtremors. Step one, the uh, observation of MHVRs. Step two, the applied uh, inversion analysis of MHVRs for estimating shear wave velocities, the profiles. Step three, uh, SAF, site amplification factor, is theoretically calculated from the estimated VS profiles. Uh, this, these techniques have been widely adopted in the previous researches, but uh, I think uh, uh, it has been still challenging to accurately estimate VS profile only from the MHVRs because in the inversion analysis, uh, 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 the trade-off between the thickness of, and the shear wave velocities has been uh, appeared in the inversion analysis. So that is the point of the difficulties of the uh, inversion techniques. On the other hand, uh, uh, Dr. Nakamura in Japan proposed the Nakamura method in 1989. So he's the originator of the Nakamura method. Uh, he found, he fa uh, he found the, uh, the strong correlation between the observed MHVRs and site amplification factors. And also, he, he also considered that the MHVRs is totally equal to site amplification factors, not only in, uh, not only the uh, uh, frequency, uh, predominant frequency, but also at the amplitude. So uh, if it is true, okay, it is good, it's over. So my research is not necessary, but uh, uh, many researchers investigated the relationship between the MHVRs and the site amplification factors in different countries and different regions. So most of them, uh, uh, they found the predominant uh, frequency of MHVRs uh, were correspond to those of site amplification factors, but significant discrepancies between the, uh, in amplitude between the two spectral ratios have uh, found at most sites. So uh, it means that uh, uh, despite of the uh, Dr. Nakamura's opinion. So recently, he, Professor Kawase et al. Uh, 2019 uh, proposed a double empirical correction method uh, to estimate the site amplification factors from MHVR based on the diffuse field assumption as shown in the right equations. So uh, he considered the uh, uh, should site amplification factors. So this is the estimated site amplification factor can be represented by this equation. So uh, they uh, obtain the uh, spectral ratio EMR and VHBR. So this spectral ratio were obtained by the observation record by the uh, uh, conventional statistical approach. So inspired uh, by the uh, Professor Kawase's research, we propose a direct uh, estimation method from MHVR to uh, site, amplification, uh, site amplification factor by using deep neural network algorithm. So in the study, we, we developed the uh, DNN, deep neural network model, uh, to estimate the site amplification factor from single site microtremor data. So in this study, uh, site amplification factors, uh, SAF, were derived by the generalized spectral inversion technique, GIT, from earthquake motion records at the seismic observation sites. So uh, after that, uh, we observe the microtremors and uh, we examine the relationship between the site amplification factors and microtremor data in the Western Japan. And uh, we developed, uh, after we developed the DNN model, so we also discussed the applicability of the DNN model, not only in Japan, but also the other countries. So this is the flowchart of this study. First, uh, we collect the microtremor data and uh, uh, after applying the spectral analysis to obtain the MHVRs at the seismic observation sites. 
On the other hand, uh, uh, we have a lot of uh, seismic observation records in Japan. So by using these records, we apply the generalized spectral inversion technique, GIT, to obtain the empirical site amplification factors. So if we get the two kinds of data, uh, supervised learning by deep neural network is performed to MHVRs and site amplification factor to, in order to develop the DNN model for estimation of uh, site amplification factor from MHVR. So our idea is very simple. So first we observe the microtremors uh, at the KNET and KICKNET site so seismic stations in Chugok district, Western Japan. So these photo uh, show the microtremor sensors used in this uh, uh, study. Uh, uh, we use the uh, velocimeter of Geodax made in Japan. So by uh, using a um, uh, uh, mobile PC. So light figure showed the uh, observation photo in front of the seismic station of Kenyet. So, uh, <clears throat> Okay, so we observed the microtremors data at uh, about uh, 100 sites in Chugok district. So this figure shows the distribution of the uh, observation station in the target area. Uh, the Chugok district uh, located in the western part of Japan. So uh, right bottom figure shows the uh, location of the Chugok district. So Tokyo is around here and Hiroshima, uh, I'm now here. So uh, Chugok districts include the uh, Hiroshima prefectures. So uh, like, uh, central figure showed the distribution of the uh, observation site. So uh, the uh, symbols of this uh, map show the predominant frequencies in the microtremors. So uh, we obtained, we measured the microtremors at the uh, approximately 100 sites. Again, I'm showing the calculation of MHVR. So MHVR is derived from the Fourier amplitudes of the horizontal and vertical components as shown in this equation. So uh, <clears throat> uh, root mean uh, uh, square of Fourier uh, spectrum of NS and EW components is used for the uh, horizontal component and uh, uh, divided by the uh, Fourier amplitude by of UD component. So target frequency of this study is 0 0.3 to 20 hertz. So uh, left uh, uh, top figure sh showed the uh, uh, example of the microtremor data and the uh, uh, bottom left figure showed the uh, uh, MHVRs at this site. Okay, on the other hand, uh, uh, G, uh, generalized spectral inversion technique, GIT, was applied based on this equation. So in this equation, O is a Fourier spectrum of the observation records, uh, observation si uh, observed seismic data at S wave part. I and J is the earthquake and site number. Uh, S, R, Q, V, S is uh, are the source spectrum, distance from source to site. Uh, Q is the Q value, it means the damping factors. And V, S is the shear wave velocity at bedrock. So uh, in this equation, G is the site amplification factor. This is uh, important uh, in this study. So uh, we said that this uh, term is uh, represented as uh, SAF. So we derived the S, Q, and G by solving the simultaneous equations obtained uh, from the observation records at each frequencies. So uh, after this slide, G, site amplification factors derived from the uh, GIT technique uh, is used. Okay, so this is the comparison of the observed MHVRs and SAFs derived from GITT at the, some typical sites. Okay, so a solid black line indicates the site amplification factor derived from GIT, and the dotted uh, line indicates MHVRs with the uh, standard deviation of the records. 
we can confirm the peak frequencies of uh, of MHVRs almost agree with those of site amplification factors, but uh, we can see the uh, significant discrepancies between the site amplification factors and MHVR, especially in the higher frequency than the uh, predominant frequencies. So uh, this trend was uh, had been uh, already pointed out by the previous researches. So in this study, we correct we correct the uh, MHVR to uh, to uh, the to minimize the gap between the, uh, those data. So this figure showed the schematic diagram of deep neural networks. So already many uh, presenters are uh, uh, introduced, but uh, let me introduce this uh, slide. After we give the input data uh, in this study, so MHVR is the input data, the uh, in, uh, important information is extracted through the several hidden layers, such as affine and uh, activation layers. And the uh, uh, predicted uh, output values are compared to the given answers. This is the target. So to uh, minimize the uh, uh, errors between those two data. And the hyperparameters in the layers are tuned by the backward propagations. So this procedure, uh, this procedure imitates the uh, recognition of the human eyes, as shown in the bottom figures. If we look at the uh, upper, so uh, neurons in the brains try, uh, propagate in the brains, and uh, we, we can judge the this photo is upper. Okay, so uh, we also applied the K fold cross validation technique as shown in the uh, Professor uh, Holhema said in the previous uh, presentation because uh, the number of data, number of tumbler is limited. So only, only 80 sites data are uh, used in this study. So that's why we adopted uh, this uh, technique. So this procedure uh, first classified the data into K groups as shown in the uh, top of the table. And uh, uh, one of them, one of them is used as a validation data set and uh, another one uh, data set is, is used as external test set. The rest of the data uh, is used as the training data set. So in this study, a 10 fold cross validation was adopted. It means that uh, one fold, one fold uh, includes the eight site data. By changing the combination of the training and validation data set, uh, nine times running were performed in this study. So finally, the generalization performance is evaluated by using the uh, external test set prepared in the uh, first. Okay, so this uh, table showed the uh, example of the input and output data. So in this study, we used uh, the only the MHVRs. So our left side of the table show the input data uh, frequency 0.3 to 20 hertz, as shown here, and the peak frequency of that site is used. The, uh, for example, this site 1.06 uh, hertz. And the input data uh, MHVRs, five uh, series of the uh, MHVRs used. So uh, FI is the uh, uh, MHVRs in target frequency, but uh, uh, we used in the uh, next uh, plus minus two uh, data uh, used to run, the, uh, to, rep uh, to reproduce the uh, shape of the spectral ratio. The right hand uh, of the uh, output data, AMR. AMR is the uh, uh, ratio of the uh, site amplification factor and uh, MHVRs. So uh, we will obtain the AMR in the, uh, this running. So should site amplification factors PSAF is, uh, can be obtained, AMRs obtained in this output times uh, MHVRs. So uh, let's figure show the flow of the developed DNN model. 
the affin and the cell radius are explained in the next slide uh, here. And the right figure shows the learning curves for training and validation data set. So 1,000 epochs was applied in the learning. So we confirmed the learning was successfully conducted, not only the training data set, but also the uh, validation data set without overrun. So uh, up in layers in the previous slide provide the weight and constant value to input data as shown in this equation. And cell layer indicate the scaled exponential linear unit. Uh, uh, it, is, it was used to activate the neurons by this equation. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, unit was uh, proposed by Kram Bauer et al. 2007. Okay, so let me introduce the result of the DNN based estimation of SAF. So, as shown in the previous slide, the black solid line is the target, the site amplification factor derived from the GIT. And the gray is solid line, PSAF, uh, showed the uh, estimated site amplification factor from MHVRs. So despite this data was not used in the training because uh, this data set is validation data, but uh, we can see the estimated values shows good agreement with the observed uh, site amplification factors. So this uh, uh, figure showed the validation for port three data, but the uh, good approximation were found in other data sets. In some data, for example, HRSH30, a uh, very big difference between the site amplification factors from the estimated values. But uh, this could be pr probably due to the uh, some topographic effect or two or three dimensional of the seismic wave propagation. Okay, so residuals between the observed the estimated site amplification factors were evaluated by these equations. So or in the uh, common logarithm scales, so these reduce, uh, residuals were calculated only from the validation data set. Upper figure show the residuals in the each frequency 0.3 to 20 hertz. So we can see the slightly larger uh, residuals in the uh, higher frequency, uh, sorry. So solid line in the mean value and the uh, dotted line in the uh, mean plus minus standard deviation. So uh, we can see the slightly larger residuals in the higher frequency, but the smaller residuals in the lower frequencies. So finally, we developed the optimal model by learning all the training and validation set. So this slide shows the result for the external test data by the optimal models. We confirmed, also confirmed the good agreement between the estimated and observed uh, site application factors. So, <clears throat> so we applied, so we developed this model uh, by using only the uh, uh, Chugok district data set, but uh, uh, we applied our DNN model to other districts in Japan. As shown in the previous uh, slide, Professor Kawase, uh, 2019, proposed a double empirical correction method, DEC method, uh, to estimate site amplification factors. So in the DEC method, uh, general uh, uh, conventional statistical approach was adapted in deriving the uh, site amplification factors. So as shown in this equation, EMR and VHBR were derived by the statistical approach. Okay, so <clears throat> anyway, we applied uh, our DNN model to the uh, data outside of the Jugo district. So solid line, Solid black line indicates the site amplification factor derived in the uh, Dr. Kawase's study. And the uh, uh, solid uh, gray line indicates the uh, estimated site amplification factor by our model. And the uh, uh, line dot, uh, dotted uh, line indicates the uh, estimated site amplification factor by the C in Kawase's study. So, when we compare the, these, those two spectral ratio, we can confirm 
So our DNN model-based estimation source shows better agreement with the observed uh, site amplification factor than the DEC approach. So uh, finally, the, the many people uh, want to ask, so the applicability of the model to other countries. So now we are uh, conducting the collaborative research with Peruvian researchers. So we applied this technique to the uh, observation site in Lima, Peru. So this figure showed the result of the uh, estimated by our DNN model in Lima City. Uh, black line indicate the uh, MHVRs in the Lima City as shown in the uh, right figure. Uh, and blue and green line as site amplification factor derived by the GIT. The, uh, the estimated site amplification factor by red lines uh, shows good agreement with the observed site amplification factor in green line. So this is a comparison of the residuals between the observed the estimated site amplification factor in Japan sites and the Lima site. So uh, we can confirm that uh, almost uh, similar residuals were obtained in these two sites. So it means uh, the site amplification factors were accurately estimated by our model with the same level of accuracy in Japan. Okay, so uh, this is uh, this diagram shows the future direction of our research. Uh, when uh, an earthquake happens, the ground motion is recorded at site one. If the seismic observation is not uh, conducted at site two, so ground motion uh, and a ground motion characteristic at site two is unknown. But if we observe the micro tremors at both sites, an estimated site amplification factor SAF and SF2. SAF2, we can evaluate the ground motion at bedrock sites by using two the uh, site amplification factors to uh, estimate the ground motion site at site two. So uh, this is a uh, 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 simple idea to evaluate the ground motion uh, estimation for future earthquake. Okay, finally, let me introduce our uh, code. So Python-based code of uh, our model is now available at the GitHub as shown in this URL. So this file includes the tutorials and uh, uh, sample data. So please visit our site and please feel free to use it to uh, apply your data for evaluating the uh, site amplification factors. So finally, let me conclude my talk. So we propose a deep neural network model for automatically estimating site amplification factor of seismic motion from micro tremor data. The proposed model produces better results than previous statistical approach such as the EC method. And uh, uh, we need to more discuss the applicability of the global site, but uh, we uh, confirm that uh, our model works uh, very well, not only Japan, but also the Peruvian side. So this model can be used to uh, for uh, more accurate strong motion predictions or detailed seismic hazard evaluations. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Mura. And now we're going to have the question and answer session. So I'm going to check the chat to see if there's anybody who has some questions or if there's anybody here in the audience who has a few questions for the last three presenters in session four. Uh, I have a, a couple of questions, so I'll get started and then see if anyone else has a few. Um, Professor Mira, this is very interesting. I enjoyed your presentation a lot. And I'm curious, um, the, the study that you did based on the data set that was available from Japan, you took the same exact model and then applied it in Peru using the available data that you had were able to record there and then simulated and compared to the records later 
you did not go through another learning process or anything with that data set, correct? Yes, that's right. So I think you're completely, muted. completely same model is, was applied to the Peruvian side. I, I'm sorry, I just caught the edge of that, sorry. Um, so if not, uh, can I have a, a question for uh, Professor Hashash? Yes, please. Go ahead. So thank you for the, your presentation. I'm also interested in your work. So your approach is a simulation based and uh, uh, our model is a totally empirical model. So my question is, so you, use the natural period of the ground in the uh, to evaluate the site application factors but uh, how do you obtain the natural period of the uh, uh, site if the no data uh, is available so uh, maybe i'll give you a little bit of a background on that the what clued us on to the uh, natural period is uh, the work that uh, dr gail atkinson was doing with h over v ratios and finding uh, the how it's uh, you know you get your natural period and how well that uh, correlates with uh, site amplification and in fact we have a paper together where we have done uh, studies on that. Now, in terms of in practice, how you would go about it, uh, from my perspective, H over V is a very good technique for doing that. And I would encourage that we would pursue that more uh, in terms of doing that. Uh, in sites where we do not have any information, neither H over V or not TNAT, then what we can do is we'll go back to VS30 only models, right? You have to work with what you have. And our development also included ANN models that were only VS30 based models without TNAT. So it all depends on the information you have. Uh, okay. Ideally, you know, you want direct measures, but there are also other things that come into play in, in especially in areas where you have sort of 3D models, uh, 3D effects, uh, simply taking, say, a vertical array and uh, uh, using the shear wave velocity down to say a reference rock to compute your uh, natural period by itself may not really represent the site period. Hence, H over V, I think, is a really good technique. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, thank you for the question. I have another question. Hopefully we're not gonna have any more echoes. <laughs> um, this is for Professor Macedo. Um, you talked about, I, I think it's interesting that a lot of you all touched on the same ideas that you know, machine learning and artificial intelligence applications are a really powerful tool, but sometimes they do still come with some limitations and how do we kind of understand where they're being extrapolated and how to apply them in our predictions and estimates and, and things like that. So where do you see you looking at next steps to improve some of that information or what would you do to try to better understand and constrain that information? Yeah, so I think, oops, I think there is an echo again over there. <laughs> it's better now, right? Okay. So uh, pro probably, for example, on the example that I was trying to put forward on not having actually data on large magnitudes and short distances, perhaps the numerical si simulation with finite, mo finite pole models could start to help on creating some data that could be used to fill those gaps, perhaps in the short term. In the long term, hopefully, we are going to be able to actually come up with something that is physics-based and also machine learning informed that could be doing the job. I think probably those are the directions that could be taken. <clears throat> there are literally some parts in the in the world where you have, for example, uh, data up to magnitude, say, five or six or something like that, and you don't have anything on the sevens and eights. So what do you do there? It's, uh, if you just feed the data on the area where you have data and you let the, the ML model or any model to extrapolate, it's, uh, you, you could be 
that's uh, kind of a difficult problem over there. So we need to have something to constrain the, the extrapolations, in my view. Thank you. Are there any other questions that anybody has for our speakers today? Uh, Kristen, I saw a question in the Q&A. Would you like me to address it? So, so the, the question is, um, for predicting nonlinear, that was addressed to me, uh, for predicting nonlinear site response, both the conventional model and ANN have used PGA-REF as a predictor variable. Is there any reason for not using period-specific intensity measure as a ref? Um, we did use SAREF in our uh, evaluations when we were doing both conventional um, and uh, as well as the ANNs. We did not see significant difference in model performance. And hence, we decided to stick with something that is simple, which is simpler for users, which is the PGA. Uh, but we do have models. I mean, there is some more limited improvement, but. Uh, uh, for the purposes of what we were working with, there wasn't much of uh, an issue. Uh, with regard to the uh, other question where, about the limitations of ANNs, um, it's for me that the part that I find always of concern to me is the e extrapolation. And, and uh, I, I like uh, the fact that, uh, you know, what Dr. Macedo presented uh, dealt with this problem as well. Um, um, this is something that I think we will be able to mitigate as we use more and more data to better constrain these models. And hopefully it will become less of an issue. Um, we can complement it with simulations, with observations. And, uh, and it, these models are really easy to update, enhance, and improve. And so I, I'd like to take one of their limitations to make it also an advantage as well. Thanks. That's very interesting. Well, I appreciate all of your time today. And I think if there's no more questions, are there any more in the chat or in the q and I think, are there any more live questions that we have? Well, I do have a couple of just closing remarks then that I'd like to share with everybody. So let me share my screen. So I wanna thank first all of our presenters for the entire day. Why is this not okay? I would like to thank everyone for the entire day because I know we've had a lot of people both come here in person. We have people all over the world who are, you know, connecting from their various different time zones, some of them waking up very early, some of them staying up very late to participate in today's events. And I really appreciate that, that they could all be here today to give us this really great information and help us learn from each other. And um, then I'd also like to remind everyone that tomorrow our colloquium will be continuing. It's going to be virtual only on Zoom. So for everybody who signed up for tomorrow's event, it's on, um, I'm not sure why this is not switching, but it's the impact of climate change on community earthquake resilience. So that will be tomorrow's topic on Zoom. And just two more notes to touch on is that the PDHs will be available starting sometime next week. So if you are interested in obtaining that, please reach out and they will be provided. And the other comment is that this will all be available as well. Um, uh, the Zoom videos from today will be available, but I'm not sure exactly when that's gonna be, but if you are a registered attendee, it will be provided to you. 